So thank you so much for inviting me. There are many specialists of ICH in Switzerland in this room. Um, for me, I'd like to add one more thing to the list of things I have done. Um, I have worked with the Musée d'Ethnographie de Neuchâtel, who is also here, and it's given me uh, insight into how museums work, and I know most of you work in museums. Uh, you work harder than we do, you are under more stress, and you're more productive. So um, it's with ex a great humility that I, ex that I want to talk to you today, because I know uh, just how much expertise you have. The thing that I know how to do is um, observe things and write notes about them. And so yesterday I observed things and wrote notes about what happened yesterday. And that's what I'd like to present to you today uh, as my reflections. I'm working with what anthropologists might call emic terms. That is, the terms that our informants use and that structure their thought about what they're doing. So I'm going to bring out a bunch of emic terms that I thought were important from uh, yesterday's very rich presentations and try to analyze them at least briefly, which means that you will be the objects of my, uh, of my presentation, which is not always particularly comfortable. Um, I tried to think if I could inspire myself from, uh, from the brotherhood of the winemakers from Vevey, the Confrérie, um, by not reprimanding you, but I couldn't just reward you because that's not my job either. So I will try to reflect on what I heard. Also, I should probably warn you, um, I'm old. Um, I may even be an old fart, is an English expression, meaning someone who is stuck in his or her ways. I'm trying to fight against it. Hence the hashtag. You see, I do know what a hashtag is. I learned it very recently. Um, I like them. Uh, I like Instagram. It stops there. I don't like Facebook. I don't use anything else. So I'm, I'm kind of a dinosaur, and I'm hoping that I can provide some useful insights from the perspective of a dinosaur. <laughs> Um, like you, perhaps, I have great ambivalence about uh, intangible cultural heritage. Uh, with Dr. Leinhofer and two other colleagues, we wrote a book about it, um, trying to make sense of what that meant as it was implemented in Switzerland, uh, with the help, actually, of the Federal Office for Culture, who supported our project. We studied the process of implementing the convention in Switzerland. It hasn't made my ambivalence go away, perhaps to the contrary. For the concept, for the abstract con concept of ICH, I, I have great misgivings. But for the individual things, practices, expressions that people do under the rubric of ICH, I have become a great enthusiast. Uh, there's not one of these practices that if I see it discussed, doesn't make me think, oh, I want to be I want to do that. I, I went to the, in another research project, we're following the candidate, candidature of uh, alpinism. And I went to an experts meeting of the Swiss, French, and Italian mountain guides and uh, experts creating the alpinism dossier. And um, I'm scared of heights, I hate equipment, and I very much mistrust groups that are made up only of men. And yet, after that session, I thought I want to be an optimist. So I have nothing against people who do ICH or whatever we're calling ICH, but I'd like to tell you that I'm a little hesitant about the concept. So what, have I, what are the words I heard many times over the course of yesterday's discussion, very rich presentations? And, You'll see I'm being very tendentious here. I selected the words I wanted to talk about. So there were many other words. These are the ones I want to focus on. Isabel Chasseau started out by talking about experience. ICH is about experience, about participation, about taking part. Um, there's one level 
of the word experience that I'd like first to highlight because it's quite interesting. I was in a similar position four years ago when the AMS organized its first reflections on ICH and museums. And the experience that museums have gained in the last four years is quite amazing. That builds their sense of experience. So the shift in knowledge, mastery, and experimentation with ICH bringing it into museums has been enormous. To the point, I would say, that there's a kind of consensus that has emerged. Uh, you can call it an epistemic community, if you like about what ICH is and what museums should do to react to it that has stabilized in a very short period of time. So perhaps it's useful to take this point in time to, to question it, to push it a little bit. Um, but the experience that um, Isabel Chasso and many of you also were talking about is a different kind of experience. It's the sense of being involved it's the ways in which museums are shifting their discourse from a discourse based on knowledge to a discourse based on being there, on having emotions, on having a sense of participation, on having uh, a ritualized relation to museums. The question, of course, that that raises is what kind of expertise we still have as in my, in my case, ethnologists who study these phenomena, and in your case, museums that have to work with them. Do we simply want to hand over our expertise to the people who are so-called the carriers of tradition or ICH, the bearers of ICH? Or that's a falsely naive question because we won't simply hand over our expertise. The sociology of experts tells us that experts don't give up their expertise so easily. They transform it, they do other things with it, but I don't believe you're going to simply say, oops, I have no more function here, please take over my museum. And I don't think you should. I'm not recommending that you do. Another word that came out of uh, Isabel Chasso, she's our Minister of Culture, if you like, so it's interesting to know how she has integrated the notion of ICH uh, in her history. Another work that came out was self-understanding. It came out in a lot of other presentations. And here I'd like to highlight another, what I think troublesome aspect of this, if we take it at face value. Who is the object of self-understanding? Who is the subject of self-understanding? In Isabel Chasso's discourse, and probably also kind of uh, David Vitali and many others. It's society. Museums help society understand itself. Society is the subject. And for anthropologists, this is a problem. Society isn't a subject. It's a set of very complex and highly political relationships. It's conflict. It's debate. It doesn't exist as a single acting uh, being. So society can't simply understand itself, which means that there's something more complex going on. Museums may very well play a part of that, but we need to spell it out. Simply saying museums help society understand itself is, a, of course, a, de a very perfectly respectable political shorthand, but it's not good enough for us. Uh, many people, uh, I think Andrea was the first one, talked about storytelling. Uh, that part of what ICH brings into museums is an emphasis on storytelling. We don't have the, the little plaquette that tells the story. We have people telling stories. When you walk up, as you have seen, uh, in the Alpine Museum, there's the people telling their stories about their relations to mountains. And I. As an ethnographer, I could hardly criticize a move towards more storytelling. That's, um, that's what we do, too. The question is, do museums tell stories like storytellers or like so-called ordinary people? Is that the kind of story that museums tell? And just in case you ever want to do storytelling on storytellers, have you ever had storytellers come into your museum? Beware. They're incredibly talkative. <laughs> That's their job. 
they talk and they talk and they talk. And it really is a wonderful way to push yourself to the limits of how many stories you want to listen to and how long they can be. So storytelling certainly, but once again, what kinds of stories do you think? Uh, David Vitelli talked about a paradigm shift. Um, and I think uh, that is right. Not in the formal sense that the ICH convention itself sets out. This is a completely new thing. ICH is not tradition, it's not folklore. That shift is necessarily incomplete. You can't simply get rid of all of the associations we have with folklore and tradition and instore a new paradigm and expect people to believe that. And when you see what are on the UNESCO and national lists of ICH, you realize that the paradigm shift is very incomplete. There hasn't been uh, a complete revolution in the way we think about traditions and what we label as traditions. But there, there are shifts, um, and Walter Leibovov's paper identifies a couple of ways in which things are shifting from ideals, great narratives, if we like, of the nation state, the nation state which is the protector of its citizens, which provides them with the basic means for life and employment and liberty, to something that we haven't identified yet, and he's identified, well, we've identified some of the, what he identifies as negative aspects, I, I would agree with him, a kind of unbridled neoliberal capitalist economy, and certain new forms of populism. So that shift has taken place, and I think what we want to work on together, I think we're all here to think about how we can make that a more positive shift, because the results so far haven't been um, positive. But we need to think, that's the background, neoliberalism and populism, against which, in which we are talking now, that's our environment now. And so the question will come up again as we get to the end of this exercise. Liquidity was a word that came up uh, in various contexts, um, in Sagra Katachin and Leonora. Leontine, yes, Leontine's presentation. Um, yes, liquidity is interesting, boundaries are shifting, the role between experts and non-experts is shifting, we're bringing new people into museums, the museums are going out, so boundaries are becoming porous. But as uh, Sandro Catechi <coughs> mentioned, liquidity is threatening, it poses problems for people's sense of where they are, what they can expect, how they can stabilize uh, their life worlds. Um, and what he was re recommending, and what we haven't talked about much, is forms of structure. He recommended ritual, which involves formalized, repetitive events that people can enjoy because they can anticipate them, because they know what's coming next, play with them because there's a structure to play with. So liquidity as a value has to be, I think, associated with forms of structure, institutional or ritualized, and that's what I think we need to be looking at with ICH. Many people talked about values. Uh, Isabel and others talked about the values behind various practices, ICH, practices. Values in and of themselves are words. Uh, I mean, values tend to take the form of words. And uh, the question is, how do these words work? What effects do they produce? I think one of the important things to take away from Sandro Catechin's presentation is that words by themselves do not necessarily produce the effects we want them. The fact, for example, that we are doing, talking about multiculturalism, talking about anti-racism, talking about integration, and there's more and more racism and less and less tolerance for difference in most industrialized democracies, that's an important lesson about the effect of words 
words can be values, so-called values, affirming one's values. It's a complex process which can create backlash. And for me, that's one of the great opportunities that museums have. They don't have to work just with words. They can work with space, they can work with objects, they can work with music, senses, and so forth. They can make messages that are not, that are less dogmatic and more exploratory and leave more room for people to assimilate them than um, the sort of oomph assertion of values which governments have to do that's what they, their rule is. An interesting concept came out of Lorenz's presentation about urban gardening, the notion of direct Erlebnis. I don't know much German, but the word Erlebnis I have learned because it's so useful. And the idea of direct Erlebnis, I think if I were a museum director, I would find it problematic. Um, there's something very powerful about direct experience, about living things, as I said, but what, or there's something very powerful about experience, what about the word direct? Where are you if experience has to be direct? What is it that allows things to be direct? And what it seems to me we've seen with ritual and also with just the general way in which museums work is experience is stronger when it's mediated. That's what you do. You mediate it, you, formal, you formalize it, you create, give it forms, and it becomes, you have the feeling perhaps of direct, direct relatedness, but what in fact has happened is very complex processes of mediation. And then I ran out of space to list, that's the problem with the hashtag, to list all sorts of other words that came up. Disruption, risk, emotions, workflow, people, lots of talk about people. And then I suddenly, about the end of yesterday afternoon, I looked back, I stepped back and I said, well, this reminds me of something, all these words. This reminds me of the other research I do about uh, the transformations of financialized capitalism in the world. These are the buzzwords of immaterial capitalism, of Silicon Valley, of uh, the creative class, of um, what are they called? Startups and uh, liquid management and horizontal organization and so forth. There's something very uncanny about the way in which the buzzwords that came out of yesterday's presentations are in fact buzzwords that we see all the time in other contexts. As I say, this whole notion of immaterial capitalism, that we make our money through branding, through intellectual property, through things that don't have material form. Of course, that's a completely Western-centric view of how capitalism works. Somebody's making the objects somewhere else. We're just making the money. Um, so there is something, both, I, I don't, I'll, I'll tell you a story so you won't be mad at me in a second. There's something both neoliberal and populist about these buzzwords. And um, I hadn't thought of it that way before and then I realized we need to think about this a little bit more. Uh, neoliberal because um, we're moving into areas of shared responsibility, which can be areas of sort of diffuse responsibility and extraction of value that doesn't look like extraction of value. Uh, populist, because as you all know, I'm sure ICH can be, not necessarily, but can very well lend itself to the clearest ethno-nationalist kinds of sentiments, of na ethno-nationalist branding. I just have a, I have a memoir this afternoon, in fact, I have to leave you because I have to go to a, a memoir defense about the castells of uh, Catalonia and how they serve the independence movement, how they're instrumentalized by the Catalonian, Catalonian excuse me, independence movement. These, you know, the human towers that are listed on the UNESCO list. So there's something happening here and we need to look at it. And the story I want to tell, too, so you don't get mad, is 
the night before my son was born, we had a name in, uh, in our heads for what we were going to name him. And it just so happened that on French TV that very night, they listed the three most popular names in France for boys for that year. And of course, the first two were the two names we had for <laughs> our son, whom we wanted to name in a pair of the original way. We wanted to do something quite different. We were quite sure that we had found the names that would sort of distinguish him from all his classmates, but in a noble and rather powerful way. Not at all. We were in l'air du temps, l'esprit du temps, the zeitgeist. We were right in there. So um, this isn't a criticism of you or us. This is what it means to be in a zeitgeist. And we need to think about it. I don't, as you can imagine, have ready-made solutions. There's the notion of community. It was another word that was used a lot. And uh, those of you who have followed the ICH project we did in Switzerland know how much I've been out uh, on the war path against the notion of community. It's used all the time. I'm originally American. In America, in the States, it's everywhere. Everything is a community. It's supposed to be all things warm and wonderful. Everyone gets along. We love each other. We protect each other. Um, we need to think about what we mean by community. There are forms of community that are created both by ICH and by museums. There are experiences of commonality, there's so-called communities of practice, there's the kind of instantaneous social network communities in which we can relate to someone in Thailand because we have the same hashtag. Uh, those are not to be, to be um, scoffed at. But the word community in and of itself uh, is a big problem. And it's a big problem in different languages in different ways. So it's a we could talk a long time about that. Do we want to try the good old fashioned liberté, égalité, fraternité? Friends, um, if I could paraphrase Leontine, it's not easy every day. Uh, it's those are the values of the nation state, the democratic nation state in one version or another. Uh, simply reaffirming them is a, is a possibility. I don't know if it's the best. It's certainly not the most creative way to face up to this problem. Do we want to promote indirect erlebnis? The notion of indirect erlebnis that do we want to be thinking more about mediation? I think so. I think that's our job, both you and I, to think about what are the mediations we do that allow people to experience things without making the, the links disappear. And finally, a word that hasn't been said once in this whole enterprise is critique. Museums are not there just to help society understand itself, they're also there to provide critique. Critique of society. And that doesn't mean museums are above society or outside society. That's the role society has given them. They're not superior by critiquing. That's what they're just doing their job, it seems to me. So should academics. Um, so something around the notion of critique has to be re-injected into this rather consensual uh, situation we now have where everybody wants people to enter their museum and to have experiences and to be a community and everything somehow is going to get better. I think that's it. Thank you.
like to thank you because I think you did a terribly good job in wrapping up yesterday's um, day and uh, everything came up again and we have a good start into the new day. So uh, <laughs> you're welcome. I appreciate what you did. Yes, and the word critique. Yes, come in. Ah, Thank you very much for this uh, rich uh, synthesis of uh, everything that was said yesterday. Uh, critique seems to me very important, uh, very relevant. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, I would say perhaps more. We have to be uh, places that are not neutral, that 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 are exactly the opposite of neutrality. We are not. Uh, we we have to we have to um, to invite uh, to discussions and to debates, even if they are pleasant, if they, even if they are uh, creating fights. I think, uh, and many museums are trying to do this. Um, so this is our political role. I I think we are we have a political role to, to play in our in our territories. I, I don't think, thank you, I don't think I have to make a comment, but I think you're talking about politics in the, in the larger sense, not politics in the local sense, but it's a question of what is it to live together. Safeguard, and that's what I miss because if we are talking about the paradigm shift, that's where the paradigm shift should occur. I'm not so much interested in those evolving lists that do tend to show a lot of folklore as we know it in the 20th, 20th century, but especially for instance, the notion of critique, it could be part of that new safeguarding paradigm, and I think that's where museums. Uh, still have to prove what their added value is to uh, add something 21st century museum practice as part of that same argument. I don't know if you agree or not. That's well, the word I was missing. Uh -huh. it, uh, it wasn't mentioned much yesterday, was it? No. It was yeah. And I didn't come up in my slides either. It certainly opens up the whole question, which I assume you would talk about, um, about what forms safeguarding can take, it, they can only be indirect and witness, of course. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of videos, it's a lot of recording of digital data, when you're talking about safeguarding in that sense. Or it's inter interaction with the communities, but I think we're going to be talking about that as well. Uh, I don't think museums per se are the ones who will uh, be the ones who will allow things to survive. I think they are part of a larger process, but museums per se cannot keep uh, something alive, safeguard something from disappearing. But I, I think you will probably be discussing this later on as you look at your toolkits. <laughs> Okay, maybe it links to what Marcus said, but in another way. Um, for me, yesterday, uh, I, 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 will, I will put it differently. For me, the consensus I saw yesterday is on the, the kind of co-creative, participatory um, discourse that is occurring, in which the word, word intangible is very present, but very often for me it wasn't about intangible heritage as I understand it, or as uh, also the UNESCO Convention tries to put it forward. Um, and I guess this will be part of our further reflection, and that's also the discourse that's, that is getting in, and that's maybe just too light because it's not going about safeguarding then, but it's about experience and about communities, and, and the light sense also, and, and so on. 
Um, so the, um, there is this kind of general discourse, and one thing I like very much, and I think it's a bit the same, uh, of, as the word critique that you used is the, the word distance that came up a few times. Um, it was not the notion of reflexivity, but I think it meant the same. Uh, in, the, in the panel which uh, Grégoire was uh, um, trying to find which role does a museum have and um, I think there is an interesting link to make between the, the, the reflection and the, and the distance and then indeed uh, make people look at their own practices and how could we contribute to safeguarding by bringing in this reflexivity. Thank you. I, I won't take up more time, but thank you for that remark. I, I did a sort of experiment with theater in, in, um, in uh, our local, in our canton, it's a very small canton, so I have our local state. Um, and it, w it went very well, and then we got money to do a film about the making of this process, of the, about the process of so making a film as we did the making of, as there was a making of film yesterday. And one of the things I began to wonder is, are we going to, is part of what's happening that we're going to make a lot of making of films? Um, because they allow us to think about the distance and the co-creation together. And then in that case, we need some really good genre development of making of films because they're very hard to make interesting. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.